right, welcome everybody. So good to have you all here. We are gathered here today for uh, a webinar that uh, this started a year ago, Tim. We had our first webinar in June of uh, 2020 and here we are 2021 every month having a webinar. Welcome to all of you to the Center of Addiction and Faith for our monthly webinar. Our topic today is addiction, grief and loss. We have two leading experts in the field of addiction related to loss with addiction. Uh, Kelly Nielsen, the grief guru, and Gloria England, founder of Recovery U. We're so happy to have you guys here. And we're also happy to have a couple of hundred of you registered for, for this uh, webinar from across the country. If you didn't hear the instructions coming in, um, if you got in after Tim spoke, you're invited to click on the chat page and write uh, your name and where you're from, just to get an idea where everybody's gathered from across the country here today. My name is Pastor Ed Treat. I am the founder and CEO of the Center of Addiction and Faith. The Center is, a, is working hard to awaken faith communities to address the problem of addiction. We think faith communities are really well positioned across the country, but they don't do enough. Uh, they're terribly uneducated, and I'm prepared to address the many problems associated with addiction. So as all of us emerge from the COVID pandemic, we're finding addiction and mental health issues are worse than ever, an enormous health crisis calling for our attention. And I think and believe that faith communities could play a vital role, but they have some learning to do. So thanks for being here today and being a part of the healing that so many need. I'd like to invite you all to begin now with a moment of silence to think about those who suffer. And we'll follow that with the serenity prayer. God, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Our webinar today is hosted by Timothy McMahon King, author of Addiction Nation, CEO of Vagabond Consulting, and board member of the Center of Addiction Faith. And Tim is the next keynote speaker at the Addiction of Faith Conference coming up this fall. Tim, thanks for hosting our important webinar today, and you can take it from here. Thank you, Ed, and thanks for all the work that you're doing with the Center of Addiction and Faith. And as I said, this has been a year now that we've been doing these webinars. It really was uh, started out of a conversation of in the midst of the rise of the coronavirus pandemic, seeing that uh, we knew that all of the different facets of life and our culture and how we relate to one another uh, with the rise of the pandemic that addiction and its consequences were gonna get worse. And wanting to figure out some way to help educate others and connect people and provide support for those who are doing this work and for those who are just starting on their journey to understanding uh, what addiction is and its consequences in our society, in our country. And because we are always focused on addiction, most of these are webinars are heavy topics. and. This is for us even heavier, and this is directly dealing with loss and death in the midst of addiction. And so as we gather, we acknowledge that no matter what faith's tradition you come from, spiritual tradition, or if you come from any at all, that this is a, a weighty place, but also a sacred place, a place where we're going to be sharing some stories about some of the hardest points in people's lives. But at the same time, we hope that this is also going to be a hopeful webinar, that we have two people with us who, in the midst of their own grief and loss, have found the strength to take their experiences and to turn those into opportunities to help others. And in the midst of the work that they've done, they have been able to bless so many others in hard, in hard places. So we hope that this, even though it's a hard topic, is something that you will walk away with, with a sense of your own potential role of being an agent for healing for those who might be in your life or your community, or those who might be still in the shadows, um, who are still holding close to them stories that they haven't yet been ready to share or tell. And that this might be a way that we can continue to affirm for others that if you've experienced this kind of loss, you are not alone. There are other people who are ready to talk to you and to help you who have been through similar journeys. And while each of our stories are unique, we can find these threads that connect us. 
And I remember early in my research and writing around addiction, talking to a father who had lost his son to an overdose and his son had died in his arms while the paramedics were still on the way. And he recounted to me the choice that he made and that he actually, when he was working on his son's obituary, got a call back from the editor who had said, are you sure you want to say that your son died from an overdose? Most people just say that a loved one died suddenly. Are you sure you want to name the true cause of death? He said, yes, that he had felt moved to not cover up what had actually happened, but to be someone who was going to name the story and try to invite others to do the same and to be a part of that work to break down the shame and stigma that still surrounds addiction. It can be so hard for family, friends, and loved ones to address in the midst of their own loss. So today we're gonna to hear from the stories of both Kelly Nielsen and Gloria England. And both of them have those same threads while their stories are different, they are drawn together by as people who have taken this pain and have worked then out of that pain to be agents of healing for others. As Ed mentioned, Gloria is the founder of Recovering You. She considers herself an ally to the recovery community and honoring all pathways to that recovery. She's also a psychotherapist and it works as a professional recovery coach and working with families um, in offering ongoing support groups. She also is the author of Living in the Wake of Addiction, Lessons for Courageous Caregiving. And Kelly Nielsen is the grief guru and also works to uh, in the world of supporting others through this process of loss after she had lost her oldest son, Quinton, to an accidental drug overdose. And she is author of the book, You're Not Crazy, You're Grieving, and continues to use her story as a place to help others um, unpack their grief and what they need to move forward in their life. So we're gonna start off um, by asking just for some of the background and story of our guests today, and then we'll move into more of a question and answer period where, where you'll be able to jump in with your own questions for both of our guests. So Gloria, I'd like to start with you and hear from you a little bit more of your background and your story and how you came to this place in your life and work. Gloria, you're still muted. Thank you, everyone. Um, thanks, Tim. And um, it's, it's great to be having this conversation with, with Kelly and Ed and all of you. Uh, what, what brought me to this work was my son's overdose in 2007. Um, many years ago, and um, you know, I was had already received my master's degree in human development, and and worked on that through most of the years of my or some of the years of my son's illness. But I will tell you, uh, so I, I received that in 1991. The only thing that we talked about in school then as far as substance use disorders was that it was um it was a either a personality disorder you know a character defect um an issue of will uh it was never ever talked about as as a brain illness and um uh and so you know having that kind of in, as my background i i fought that for a long time until i you know, I intuitively, and I, you know, I think again, this, you know, this was uh, the, the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, about five years before my son died, I got this, this uh, thought in my head, well, if Aaron was sick from anything else, cancer, you know, um, if he had had a heart attack, you know, anything that was disabling him and that, you know, he had a chance of dying, how would I want to be treating him? And that, that opened a whole new perspective for me that um, I really had no one else to share with except my, my husband and a few um, 
a few close friends, a few close Al-Anon friends, because that was really the best place that I was getting support at that time. And so I totally and completely changed my perspective from, you know, this is a person that's not trying hard enough. He's not doing this. He's not doing that. Um, you know, it's not following up with this appointment or that appointment or and start focusing um, on what he was doing right and and uh, applauding him for that and um, treating him like he, you know, the, the person he was, my very ill son who had a, a chance of, of dying from this illness. And that that made all the difference for me, um, you know. It wasn't until 2018, or I mean 2019, that the uh, Center for Addiction, or the uh, American Society of Addiction Medicine, finally revamped their def definition, saying addiction is a treatable chronic medical disease involving complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, the environment, and the individual's life experience. People with addiction use substances are engaged or engage in behaviors that become compulsive and often continue despite the harmful consequences. So, you know, the original definition of that came out um, um, in 2011, my son died in 2007. I had no concept that there was any research or scholarly um, look in into this. And so if I wouldn't have had that intuition, that, that message, um, and I, I do think it was from the Holy Spirit to, to start treating my son as somebody that was chronically ill instead of chronically defected, um, then I, I don't know where we would have been at the end. We, I was so fortunate to have a really loving, caring, um, compassionate uh, you know, relationship with him the last couple, three or four years of his life. Um, and I owe it all to that perspective and and also because the boundaries that I had you know Aaron was sick for almost 20 years before he died he started out with with street drugs um, you know marijuana and um, mushrooms and you know I think his first experience of of uh, of being um, high was he accidentally sniffed gas when he was mowing the lawn and he came in and told me about that. And I said, well, don't, don't ever do that again. You know, not, not even thinking, uh, but, but, you know, and when we were in a um, family group in a treatment center, he talked about that being his first experience. And so from that, you know, like I said, it was, it was marijuana and street drugs. He didn't really use much alcohol, um, but it was in his early twenties that he got involved with opioids and, and heroin and, um, and the last five years of his life, he was in and out of treatment centers trying to, to get the help that he needed. Now, um, back then, you know, the insurance that he had said, you can only go to treatment once a year that we will pay for it. I mean, things have changed so dramatically, right? And sometimes he'd have to wait for two or three weeks to even get an assessment and then wait three or four months to get a bed. Now, I know a lot of that is still going on. That's one of the things that just frustrates me beyond words that really the number of people needing treatment continues to, to go up. And the percentage of people who get help is still the same. It's just about 10%. Um, and and you know we, we have more detox facilities now, um, but but really the medical community and I think the political community is is way behind um, where we need to be in, in giving support. That's why it's so important for you know religious and you know, and spiritual leaders to really understand this illness and start talking about it. You know. In, in terms of, of helping people who need help, who have a compulsion they can't control. Um, and one of the things that I have been involved with for the last um, 15 years is that my, my church, Mayfair United Church of Christ in, in Minneapolis has um, a, a support group that acts as a, a reference place 
for our congregation. It's called Mayflower Addiction Recovery Support. And we got all of our training from the Faith Partners Organization. And we have been going strong for 15 years. And all of us, you know, receive phone calls or somebody comes up in church and says, you know, I need, I need these resources. We do not do any counseling or support per se, except to help people get hooked up with the correct resources. And, you know, I remember at one point um, before we began Faith Partners, we um, had a, 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 a um, poll that we did of our congregation to find out how, you know, what was the percentage of our congregation that had been experienced um, any kind of, a, you know, addiction in their family or knew of someone. And I had somebody from another group in my church come up and said, you know, our congregation is not interested in anything like this. We don't have any of this in our church. And our, our, when we got the poll back from, from the Faith Partners Organization, um, it showed that our congregation, now this was way back 15 years ago. So what would have that been, 2006, 2005? our congregation was, had the same percentage of people that had experienced substance use disorders somewhere in their life as the general population, which back then was 85%. Now that's risen dramatically. So um, I, I never talked to that other person <laughs> about that specific, but you know, it's um, churches really need to do whatever they can to, to talk about this and bring that that stigma to light and um uh, and that organization in the church and all the relationships that i've formed with those people over the years they were some of the most important people that supported me when my son died because traditional grief groups for me did not work because nobody really understood about the disease of addiction at all. And I found myself educating people in order to get the support that I needed. And I thought, wait, th this isn't this isn't right. <laughs> I'm here to get help. So I just went back to my my family support group and, and they at least understood addiction. Um, and that's where I, I got most of my support. And there was a befrienders organization in our church and I got a lot of support from from her. So that was what really um, I made a promise to myself after that experience that when um, when I felt healed enough from my son's loss, that I would go on and offer the grief group specifically for people who've had a substance use disorder. So that's how that all started. Thank you, Gloria. And I have a lot more to follow up on there as well. But Kelly wanted to turn to you and hear your background and how you came to this place. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. You know, uh, I myself am not an addict, but I've been surrounded by addiction on all sides in every facet. So I grew up uh, a middle child of a Midwestern family. I grew up in Minnesota, actually, and my father was and is an addict, and that profoundly affected our entire family. And so uh, even though he went through the recovery process for alcoholism, he then turned to pain pills and became an addict of pain pills. And just seeing the destruction on his life and my family's life um, was devastating. Uh, my mother and he had a really toxic, codependent, unhealthy relationship. And so actually, my story begins from that place that... Um, watching their relationship and seeing the toll it took on our entire family and kind of his deterioration of his health and mind and body um, ultimately led to him being hospitalized in January of 2017 and being held on a psych hold and, and some pretty traumatic events um, in that month, which led up to uh, my mother taking her life in February of 2017. And so that was um, a shattering event in, in my life and for our family. My family has never recovered from that. And for me, it was a crisis of faith. Uh, I did, my family's not a Christian household. I didn't grow up in a Christian household, but I did find my faith at age 30. So I had been walking with the Lord for approximately 10 years when my mom took her life. And 
Um, the way I describe it is that grief for me came in like a flood and it swept me out to sea. I was devastated. I was overwhelmed. I was confused. I was angry. I was so angry at God. I didn't have a box to put it in. I didn't, um, there were a lot of other circumstances around my mom's passing. And, and so, you know, my, we don't even know my dad may have had a hand in it. So all that to say, it was kind of larger than life. It was bigger than, um, me or anyone in my immediate support system could kind of wrap our hands around. The joke at the time was that my life was like an episode of Dateline, you know, like we couldn't believe that this was happening, but it had happened. Right. And like I said, it was a crisis of faith for me. I, I looked for help. And this is, this is the point in the part, right. Of this conversation is that I looked for help. I sought help in the church and I did not find help there. Um, I didn't find people that had tools or resources for me to move through this in order to um, be healed and whole. And so eventually I found my way into a suicide support group and I was comforted that for the first time I was in a room of people who understood my pain and that was very comforting. But it was also horrifying because everyone in that room was not living. They were surviving, but they weren't living. You know, there were people... The majority of people in that group were not able to work. They were just really severely debilitated by the impact of loss on their life and the, the way grief was affecting them. And people in that group had been there for you know months or even years. And that to me was horrifying, but I, I just began to believe the lie that you don't ever recover from that. I began to believe that this is what my life was gonna entail. I was just gonna be sad and kind of going through the motions for the rest of my days. And I existed like that for several months before, thankfully, I saw a speaker that changed everything for me. I, I heard a woman named Immaculate present on stage at a leadership event, and she had survived the Rwandan genocide. And she shared in horrific detail the experience of being hit away in a bathroom for 90 days with eight other women while she literally heard over the radio everyone she had known being massacred. And she shared how God not only um, kept her alive during that experience, but walked her through a healing and recovery process after the fact so that she was healed from her grief. And I saw for, for the first time, someone who had been through something worse than what I was facing and she was healed and she was whole and she was full of joy and she was expectant of a good future and hope hopelessness literally broke off in that moment you know when people talk about having a light bulb moment I had a light bulb moment sitting in that audience I decided right then and there if she could do it I could do it and if God would do it for her he would do it for me and I decided no matter how long it took, I was going to figure out how to recover from this tremendous loss of losing my mom. And I just leaned in. I started studying. I started praying, you know, getting into the word time with the Lord. I started learning about uh, neuroscience and how our bodies work and how our bodies are affected by grief and trauma. And I just started paying radical attention to everything in my environment and kind of honestly through trial and error figuring out what was helpful to me and what was hurting me and creating a system for my own healing and recovery. And I'm so thankful that I did. I started to feel back to myself and kind of operating um, at, at a higher level again. And it was only six short months after that, that I got the news that my son had died of an accidental overdose. And um, so this time, you know, grief came in again. It wanted to, you know, sweep me out to sea, but I had tools this time to navigate grief. And my experience of mourning my son was night and day different than the loss of my mom. And it was in that moment that I realized this can be taught. You know, this, these tools and this skill set is something that can be learned. We don't have to just lay around and have let grief have its way with us. We can and should take a proactive and active and interactive role in our recovery. You know, that recovery is not only possible, it's what God would have for us. And that we're not only, it's not only available to us, it's actually our responsibility. You know, trauma is not your fault, but healing is your responsibility. And one of the reasons I feel so strongly about this is, you know, when we when we got the news that my son died, 
my daughter, I, I have a daughter as well. She was 12 at the time. She, she was sitting with me. And the first thing she said, I'll never forget. She said, mom, you're not going anywhere, are you? Because see, trauma and addiction, it happens in families and it compounds in families. And addiction in a parent means more likely addiction in a child. And suicide from one member means more likely addiction or suicide from other family members. And actually a lot of people who struggle with addiction, the underlying stuff is connected to trauma or grief that was never dealt with or never resolved. And I think about my own mother and how she was unable and ill-equipped to handle everything that was going on with my dad and his addiction and that led to her taking her life and so I am passionate about reaching the family members at the point of crisis when there is loss when there is trauma getting people the resources and tools that they need because we all have to learn how to heal and recover and we the first thing is we have to believe that it's possible we need to understand that complete healing and recovery is possible and available to us and then we need to have a roadmap and help to get ourselves healed and whole for the sake of our families, for the sake of not extending continued trauma, continued addiction, generation after generation. And so um, after the loss of my son and just seeing how much more um, easy I was able to navigate through things, that's when I said, this needs to be shared. You know, people need to learn these things. They need to, number one, know that it's available because I don't know where I would be if I hadn't heard that speaker on stage. You know, tragically, and I hate sharing the story, but it's the, the truth. When my son passed away, I went to church and I went up to prayer line and there was a couple leading the prayer that had lost a child 17 years prior. And they told me it hurts as much today as it did that day. And it's never going to get better. You're just going to learn to live with it. And if that is the belief system we're holding, and if that's what our leadership and churches are telling people, then we are dooming people to mediocrity or just this idea of just surviving and just getting by and just learning to endure. And I know that Christ came that we would have life and life abundant in every circumstance, in every situation. And he paid for even this. And so that's what I am busy doing now for the rest of the days that I'm here, as much as I'm able to encourage and equip people with the tools and resources so they cannot just survive, but actually be healed and get back to a place of loving their lives and being active, engaged, thriving people within their church and within the body of Christ. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And both of you just to take a moment to honor your stories and your willingness to share that with us. And one thing that I'm reminded of, and so in my own story, I was in the hospital for several months, I was in the ICU, and it was what I've heard some religious folks call a, a casserole dish church moment, right? When I was in the ICU with a acute necrotizing pancreatitis, it's hard, it's challenging, but you know, my parents could put up a caring bridge site to give everybody updates on how I was doing and my medical condition. There were some folks who were supporting my parents with meals. People knew how to write a card of encouragement. Didn't mean it was easy, but there was a frame of reference that people had. But when there was the subsequent experience with addiction, not only was that not there, we didn't know how to tell other people. We didn't have the language or, and the shame that was there. We didn't talk to others. And so there wasn't, not only was there not the response as that many people would know how to do, there wasn't any way to get that additional support because we didn't want to talk about my experience. And so Kelly, I just was hoping to follow up with you there. Um, if you could unpack a little bit more about why you think it can be hard for people to provide the support that's needed. And if there are some practical ways that to help people think about this, that might shift how they respond to others to create a better environment of support in the midst of loss like this. Well, I think there's two main reasons, especially as it relates to loss. I think there's two reasons that people kind of miss it when it comes to supporting people. The first is 
death is most people's biggest fear, right? Their own death and death of a loved one, especially a parent who loses a child. For me, I represent most parents' biggest fear. And so it makes people awkward and uncomfortable and they kind of don't want to go, you know, in order to approach you, they have to confront their own fear and what that would be like for them if they lost their child. And so it's just uncomfortable. So for a lot of people, it's just easier uh, to avoid it altogether. The second thing is that people don't want to say the wrong thing. We live in a politically correct, you know, society and environment. Everybody's so afraid of offending everybody that I think for a lot of people, you know, the risk of saying the wrong thing would keep them from saying anything, which only compounds the problem because then, and I experienced this, I had the, the biggest struggle, the biggest heartache of my life. And then all the people I normally leaned on isolated themselves from me. And so now I have the isolation compounding this biggest thing I've ever tackled. And so if as much more conversations like this, as much as we can bring conversations into the light and make it more mainstream to discuss these things so that people feel comfortable to have these um, conversations. And I think for those of us who are grieving, to give people grace, you know, if somebody says the wrong thing, they're trying, they're trying to meet you where they're at and make it okay for people to reach out, even if they say the wrong thing, but it's so necessary. Thank you. And, and Gloria, with your story, could you share with us, um, you had experienced the loss of your son at a time where there was even less attention on overdoses and what was happening. Um, can you share a few of the things that you felt were particularly helpful or supportive that happened or some, how people were able to um, support you in a positive way? And we also know that uh, there are some things that we can kind of help people stay away from um, that might be well-intentioned, but we can help guide folks to other ways more constructive sorts of responses. Thanks, Tim. I, you know, I just think Kelly is right on about about what she said about people. You know, I, I kind of had the feeling too that I had something that no that nobody else um, wanted to catch. You know, like if they they talked to me about my son, it was going to happen to their child or something. It, it was a very a very well weird feeling. The other thing that um, I think goes without saying is that the stigma and shame that follows the illness also follows um, the person that is grieving. And um, people don't want to, you know, people don't, like Kelly said, people don't want to say the wrong thing. They, they don't want to talk about addiction. So at my, one of the things that I think helped me and my family is at my son's memorial service, we talked about both experiences of my son's life about what what he was like when he was in recovery and what he was like before he became ill and also what some of the experiences we had were when um when he was you know operating from that that place of compulsion and that we always loved him and and always encouraged him to stay in touch with us and so i think talking about it at the service and making it a very open conversation made it easier for people to say, you know, something to my, my other uh, sons and my, uh, his birth father and his stepfather and myself, fo even following the service as people came through the line to greet us, you know, they, they said really meaningful things about, I'm so glad you explained about, you know, Aaron, I really didn't understand. So I think to encourage the, the, you know, the spiritual community, if they are helping someone plan a, a service to just like the, the, the gentleman that you knew, Tim, that wanted to put it in the obituary, you know, you don't want to do something that people do not want to do. And again, the stigma and shame is great. But I think for clergy, just to be aware of the healing that goes on when something like that is spoken at, at, as a, at, a, at a service. And so, you know, we had many friends at the service and we had a lot of business um, acquaintances. And um, I don't know, uh, before the, the event started today, Tim and I were having a conversation uh, from uh, an article that a colleague of his, Carolyn Woodruff wrote called, um, you know, 
uh, what I can't remember that I can't exactly remember the the title of the article, but if anybody wants it, just email me and I will send it. But she talks about firefighters and, and builders uh, when there's grieving. And I always share this with uh, um, my, my grief group clients because there are people that will come to you that you thought, you know, I thought it would be my best friends that would show up that would be the firefighters, the people that stood by me right after my son died. And quite frankly, it was a lot of those people that I didn't know very well at the um, service that then followed up with me and, and made sure that I had support. And then there's builders, there's people that kind of come in afterwards. And, um, and a lot of those people surprise me. There's very few people that can be firefighters and builders, but I, I have a few in my life. And they, they, you know, they support me in my work as a way that supports me in my healing through my, my grief. I would, I would never have had the healing in my grief if I wouldn't have uh, continued my, my work in this area, I think. I think that's really had a lot to do with it. Thank you. And for anyone who's listening right now, um, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A button. Feel free if you've got any questions for our guest today, go ahead and drop a question in that Q&A box and we'll try to get to them as they come in. And as folks are doing that, uh, Kelly, you had also talked about the family dynamics and how your story really started much earlier with the experiences with your father and the ways that those dynamics um, can compound on each other, but also that people can begin to be a catalyst for healing in that. Can you tell us more about some of the lessons you've learned about those challenging family dynamics? Well, I think it's just important to recognize, you know, it's so frustrating. I'm sure Gloria can attest as well that when you're when you're a family member of an addict, everything's about the addict and how do we support the addict and how do we help the addict and how do we, you know, and then meanwhile, the family members can be dying on the vine. You know, the family members who are getting the middle of the night phone calls and not sleeping because you don't know if your child's alive or dead or, you know, and my mom was a casualty of that. You know, my mom was a casualty of not, you know, in fact, the last conversation I had with my mom, I said, mom, what are we going to do for you? What kind of help and support are we going to get for you? Because this is very stressful for you, you know, and she said she was going to go to a Christian women's group and get some help. And that's the last conversation I ever had with my mom. So it's twofold, right? I think the systems and church leadership, and we need to understand that you can't treat one and, and neglect the other because if you treat the addict but you don't help the family you're just going to end up back where it is but the other part is the family members understanding that concept that we and we alone are responsible for our health and well-being and so whether the addiction is someone else's you know issue or problem or if you lose someone you are responsible to to get yourself well to get the tools that you need so you have to get this this belief that it's possible and then this inner fire that no matter how many you know if you have to test out five support groups before you find the right one for you if you have to go to eight counselors or if you have to read 27 books like whatever it is for you but you have to understand that no matter what's going on in your family dynamic you're the only one that can get and keep yourself well um, but that also needs to be coupled with you know systems coming in to support and help you in that effort. Thank you. And Gloria, you had mentioned specifically that you had worked with faith partners to develop resources inside of a congregation. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what the, that looks like? Well, it involved um, those of us who, I think there, there was only about eight of us or maybe six or eight of us and we um you know we had all had uh family members who were in the throes some of us still in, of addiction as my son my son was in and out um we had people whose whose loved ones had recovered also and so faith partners has a specific training for this um and you know i'm i'm sure that ed or anybody else can can give you that those resources but it really helped us to know that the church was behind us, that the church was not 
paying attention to the stigma that's attached to this and really wanted to educate the congregation. So I think we went through a couple of trainings. We kept in touch with, with Drew, who um, his, his, help me with his last name, Ed, it's escaping me right now. Um, Drew Brooks. Drew Brooks. Drew Brooks, right. And uh, I mean, Drew actually interviewed our, our um, group last uh, year because we were one of the few groups in the Minneapolis area that kept really strong and, and continued to grow. So our group gives support to each other, kind of in the same way as a recovery group would, but we also are out there doing things in the community. Um, just as an example, when the uh, Steve's law was passed in 2014, which uh, meant that Narcan could be accessible to anybody, right? At any place, you didn't have to have a prescription for it. Um, our church, uh, uh, you know, ran a, a, a write-in campaign uh, to you know, the policymakers in our state to make sure that that happened and our church got behind that. So, so you know, our, we're, we're not just a silent organization. We also have um, a recovery Sunday um, every year and we bring in a recovery speaker and um, that is experienced, you know, recovery and, and, and from, from many different pathways. It, it may not just be alcoholism, it may be drug addiction, it may be gambling. And we have huge attendance at those, as, at those um, recovery Sundays. And then the adult ed uh, that goes along with that recovery Sunday is also about you know, something that's uh, related um, to addiction. So, and then we also do one other program during the year. Uh, that we get program time. I mean, that's really important that the church and the ministerial staff has to trust that we're gonna, you know, take our training and do the best that we can with that. And, and, and allow, and, you know, our church allows us to, you know, be part of an ongoing communication in our congregation in, in as many different ways as possible about um, addiction and recovery. Yeah, it's often like, pulling the bandage off. Exactly. Where the initial conversation may not be perfect. And in fact, it might be messy, but it's, it's identifying that there is a wound there. And I, you know, I think to have a clergy that trusts us that we are, that we, you know, we show them our resources. I mean, you know, we have a clergy that comes into our meeting and, you know, has, is, and, comes to our, our meetings and they see the work we're doing. They see where we're trying to go. They trust us that we're, we're going to serve the congregation out of, you know, out of love and faith. And I think, I think that's a really important thing, you know, to let, to let us do that because they, you know, they have a lot of other um, ministries to serve in, in our church. Mm -hmm. I yeah, have someone who just posted in the Q and A box says that their younger pa brother passed away just over a year ago. His death was caused by a seizure due to drug use. My mom still hasn't spoken with a therapist or counselor about it. How can I encourage my mom to reach out to someone to help her through her grief? She's been either avoiding her grief or sits too deep in it. Kelly, could you take a response at that for us? This is a great question and issue, and it's kind of like evangelism, right? <laughs> you can't, somebody has to be ready to hear. Um, but that's why I know at The Grief Guru, we offer a lot of things in a lot of different modalities so we can meet people where they're at. And so one of the resources I wanted to let everybody know about is we have this great grief survival guide. And it's very simple. It's a top 10 tools for navigating grief. It's on our website. But that is a great tool for the people who are afraid and they don't know what to say. They, they can read it themselves and help to implement some of the things on that tool guide. They can send it. And it's a really easy, you know, hey, I know you experienced loss. Here are some things that may help you. Um, and then we also have free resources as well. So I know I personally, for me, when, when someone in, in my life goes through loss, I, I send them a small little gift, a small little something, and then just encourage, just open the invitation that if they want to talk more or if they want more help or more resources that I, that I'm there to help with that. You know, you can't, 
grief is incredibly personal and incredibly intimate and no one, they're not going to deal with it until they're ready to deal with it. And so learning to, you know, my, the way that I deal with grief is not the same way that my sister has dealt with it, you know? And so allowing people enough freedom and grace that it's their journey and supporting them where they're at. And at the meantime, doing everything that you can to get yourself well, because the best advertisement is you getting really healthy and whole and working through it and being that example of what life looks like on the other side. If you, if you're healthy and back to enjoying life and your, and your mom can see that, that's going to be the, the most attractive thing for her to see, wow, what is she doing? Maybe I need to try something that she's doing, but it's the thing that breaks my heart. I see parents, especially more than any other type of person, parents that lose kids. Um, and, and this is getting into the weeds a bit, but there's a lot of parents that believe the lie that they're not a good parent if they can be happy after they lose a child, or they're somehow defaming or dishonoring their child by learning to live a full life after they're gone. And, and those are some of the things that we tackle in my curriculum and course, because those lies um, can keep people stuck, you know, just like the lie that if you believe the lie that you'll never recover, then you can save yourself any kind of curriculum or coach because that's where you'll stay, you know, um, but so for the family members who see people who are stuck and are wanting to help understand um, there's only so much you can do and the best thing you can do for them is get yourself really healthy and invite them to into that. Hi. Appreciate that a lot. And even just one part of what you said that was so practical of if you know someone in your life who experiences this kind of loss, that you can with a gift or a card, open up the door and make clear that you are there and that the next step might need to be them. And this, just like with addiction, we can't force someone into a place where they don't wanna go. And sometimes our efforts to force can backfire. Um, but that kind of open invitation is so important. And Gloria, that was something that you had talked about how your um, final years with your son were very different because you had that change of perspective. Um, and could you talk to us about how you during that time were able to continue to be supportive um, and loving and have an open door? while also making sure, as Kelly had highlighted, making sure that you also were getting what you needed to continue to be in a loving place and that you had the support that you needed to keep being that person. Yes, and I, I, I do wanna follow up on just quickly what Kelly said. I will tell people, you know, I, I always have a short conversation with each of my grief group members to make sure that they understand that my grief groups aren't just a drop in place. They are, there's a curriculum to each one of them and each week builds on another. And um, I cannot tell you how many people call me and say, yes, they want it. We have our little discussion and um, say that they're ready to start the group. And then when I send them out, you know, the information that they need to fill out to, you know, little registration papers, a little bit more information about them. I don't ever hear from them again. And I, I really think it's, and you know, it's important to keep touching back with that person. If if they say they don't need the help or they're they're not ready, um, that they they can they may be ready down down the road. That I have a, many people that come back when they're ready. You know, Kelly talked about the trauma that happens um, to people who experience substance use disorder. And that is transferred also to the loved ones as they watch them go through it. And most people are in a state of shock if it's an accidental death. And you know, they, people say you need help, you need help. And they, they're not, you know, they, they have to get sometimes, you know, personal therapy or help to deal. And, and I, I refer a lot of my clients to trauma therapists to, help them understand that, you know, this is why they, they can't function yet in the, in, in the world the way that they, they want to. So I, I think that's really, in, really important um, to remember. And I, I, always, I have some basic information about trauma as part of my, my curriculum. And to quickly speak to what you talked about, um, you know, 
the boundaries that I drew with my son when he was using were boundaries about what I needed to feel safe in the relationship. They stopped being about trying to control his use. All my boundaries used to be about controlling my use. So when I would say to him, you know, Aaron, you're, you're welcome. When, if, you're, if you're still using, you're welcome to come home, get the clothes washed. Um, I'll pack up some food for you. You can spend a night or two, but I can't have you stay here because I don't know if you're going to leave in the middle of the night, you know, to get drugs or somebody's going to show up the door. I have three other boys here and I don't sleep when you're in the house and you're using. And when I just spoke plain language to him about what I needed, that then those, you know, those boundaries were always honored when, when, and that's what I needed to take care of myself, my own self care. When the boundaries were about trying to control his use, you know, he didn't care. But when he, he, he heard the personal impact it was having on me and not in a shaming way, but just a matter of fact way, it made all the difference. Thank you for that. And so folks know too, had just dropped both Kelly and Gloria's uh, websites into the chat so that you can see more of the resources that they have there. And we'll also be doing, um, Ed is going to be dropping a link into the chat where we will be having a Zoom meeting immediately afterwards. And so the reason why we switch back and forth is the webinar allows us to have lots of participants um, and then we do the meeting afterwards where that's everybody's cameras can be on and we can have more of an easy conversation and not just the presentation. So just so you know that that's why we do that. There's a few more pieces in here that I want to cover before I turn over to Ed for some closing announcements. Um, had a uh, just a thank you from Tracy um, for talking about this from a mom perspective. And she said that helped me and I can apply to supporting my surviving children that lost their brother to addiction overdose. I have three boys, eight, 15, and 23. And we talk about our son, Chiron, all the time and celebrate him in special ways. They seem fine and aren't willing to go get therapy. It's hard to know how to support them and to make sure that they will be okay. I'm thankful that they continue living and model that for my boys. So thank you for that, Tracy. And then we have a few questions that have been along a similar theme. Um, one was just asking for additional resources that help open up conversations around grief and these ideas of resurrection and new life. And then in particular have somebody who is asking, um, they work in the recovery field and they're constantly developing bonds with people and then lose them uh, to their addictions. And it's been devastating time and time again. There are times, um, and this is a direct quote, where I question myself, did I do enough? Could I have done something differently? And so do you have any resources for people working in the field and dealing with loss and grief? So this will kind of be our last go around. And this is a time just for you all to talk more about the resources you have um, and any responses to those things in particular. Um, so we'll go ahead back to you, Gloria, and then finish with you, Kelly. Thanks, Tim. You know, if, if, um, if you go to my, my website, there are, there are many, many, resources um, there. Um, I'm, I think also um, one of my uh, favorite uh, books regarding this is um, a recent book that was written uh, is the, the sixth um, finding, finding Meaning and um, in this by David, uh, uh oh, I'm, I'm losing it right now. Um, but again, it's, it's listed on my, my, my website. I think that, um, that the most important thing as far as a resource goes is, is again, for the church to be there for parishioners and to continually ask where they are in their journey. Um, and, and also to, you know, Ed Treat has a wonderful thing that he says to people. Um, when people don't know what to say, say, tell me about, you know, Aaron, that, that, that was my son's name. Just tell me about Aaron. Or, you know, is there anything about today that reminds you about Aaron? And I think having those really simple conversations um, about people is, is extremely healing and can be extremely helpful as, as, a, as a resource to their 
their healing. Um, I also like uh, Martha Whitmore's um, book, Healing After Loss, Daily Meditations for Working Through Grief. Um, this is a book that I continue to read over and over again. And as my grief journey has grown and changed, every meditation in here has a different meaning to me over the last 14 years. Um, because as I grow and change, then the meditations mean something different to me. So this is probably my, my, um, my, my go-to as far as um, resources. And I do have many other resources um, listed on my website. Thank you. Kelly? Yeah, likewise. I have a lot of resources on my website and I have a YouTube channel with a lot of videos that discuss a variety of topics related to grief. Um, I do have two, two kind of main services. Um, one is an individual community-based learning. Um, so it's online learning and community. And then I'm actually creating right now and will be releasing in the fall a church-based curriculum. So I'm designing a course that's intended for life groups to go through and train up the leaders and really equip the church to deal with this. But I want to speak specifically to the, the lady's question. She said she works in this field, right? And she's consistently losing people. Um, I've lost six very close people since my son died three years ago because I was immersed in this community. And for me, I decided it was too close to home. It was not healing. It was not helpful. It was, it kept in my instance, ripping off the wound and, and I was being perpetually re-injured. And so I just think that that's a very personal decision for yourself about where your anointing and grace is. You know, it's similar to a doctor or a nurse or a pastor, you know, that's a very draining thing. And, and, and you have to decide personally if you're called and equipped to do that kind of work and then if so you have to uh, get really radical about your boundaries and how you're going to maintain your peace and your um, mental health and ability if you're going to continue in that job because the last thing that we need is for you to be burning out and and put yourself in, in harm's way or your family in harm's way so that's just my my two cents of advice i i don't i'm not familiar with i certainly don't have and i'm not familiar with you know um curriculums or resources specifically for works folking or works or folks working in that um arena but i'm, I'm sure they're probably out there Thank you, Kelly. And I'll hand it over to Ed to close. And Ed, I'm not sure if you just saw in the chat too that we do have Teresa with us today to hold her and her family in extra care as they lost a loved one just earlier this week. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, our prayers go to you, Teresa. Um, uh, having been a pastor for 25 years, I, I think I lost count after 400 funerals. So I've walked, uh, stood at the graveside with so many families that what I discovered early in my ministry was that um, I, I, I feel especially gifted to to walk with people during those times. I had an experience at the graveside, waiting, my very first funeral, waiting at the graveside, looking at this open grave, and I was waiting for people to come. I was just a seminarian. I was so nervous. And I was thinking, what do I say here? What do I say? And, and I, uh, staring into this grave, I had this epiphany or some vision of, it was very brief, but it's very real, that I wasn't looking at a hole in the ground, but a doorway. And, uh, and, it, and it was that experience that I felt God saying, you're going to be God's doorman for me. You know, I get to stand on this side of the door and tell people it, that hole is not the end of your life. There's something else and you're going to go through and experience it. And so I've been able to walk with people. I had an AA sponsor who used to like to say, you know, AA is the last house on the block because it's the last thing people will try before they've tried everything else. And I got to preside at his funeral and I was able to stand up and say, no, there's one more house. There's one more house and uh, it's the best one of all. And so, you know, there's a word of grace that we all need to hear here in the midst of grief. But I also know that um, my sister died when I was 14. And it wasn't until I was three years into recovery at age 30 that I finally grieved that loss and realized that that ungrieved loss well, it played a large part in my addiction and my drug use over the years because it was just this thing that was in my, sitting in my chest, unresolved. I didn't even know it was there. Um, and that's how important this work is. So thank you, Tim and Kelly and Gloria for your work and for being here today and inspiring us all. I was... Uh, it's such an important topic, and especially in a time like this coming out of the pandemic, there is so much loss, uh, so many deaths, but also just the loss of jobs and, 
and everybody's lives have been turned upside down. There's a lot of grief out there and uh, there's a lot of work to do. So um, I put in, uh, I'm gonna mention some, uh, do some announcements here real quick before we flip over to the Zoom meeting, but I've put all the links, uh, links of already. Some of these have already been put in, but I'm gonna mention them here. And just so you know, there, you can copy and paste all of those. Those are the links that I'm gonna reference in my announcements. Um, there's a, a link there for Kelly's work, for Gloria's work, and there's a link there for Tim's book. I highly recommend you get his book on addiction because it's not uh, just about addiction. It's about our whole country and how we are an addicted nation. Um, and it's, an, it's an, a profoundly good book. Um, so there's a link there to, to get his book. Both Tim and Kelly will be presenting at our next Addiction and Faith Conference. Uh, Gloria was invited to be there, but she will be grieving a family member <laughs> that weekend. And, and uh, so uh, she, uh, Kelly has stepped in to uh, fill the spot to talk about grief and addiction. Next month on July 29th, we have our special guest uh, speaker will be Reverend um, um, Jan Brown. She's the founder and director of Spirit Works Foundation. She'll teach us about the invitation to change a groundbreaking and holistic approach to addressing addiction and supporting healthy communities. So that's uh, next month for our webinar. There's a link there to register for that webinar. You can copy and paste that now and register. Along with these webinars, the Center of Addiction and Faith offers so many helpful resources. We have our annual conference coming up October 7th, 8th, and 9th. It's the best thing we do, and I hope you'll make an effort to be there. And if you can't be there, there's a hybrid option. It brings together today's best and brightest scholars, theologians, speakers, authors. Uh, it's an amazing gathering. Uh, the fellowship there is tremendous. Um, take advantage of early bird prices. Register for the conference. There's a link there to do that. Twice a month, we have a podcast that tell the story of clergy who were impacted by addiction and found recovery. And you can find these inspirational stories on your Apple Music or your Spotify, or better yet, download our free smartphone app. It puts all of our resources at your fingertips. Um, that app is at your app store. Just look for Center of Addiction and Faith. It's all free. There's more we want to offer, but we need help to do all this work. So if you feel so inspired or inclined and you can help out, there's a there's a donation link there. You can click on and, and share a couple of dollars with us to help us do this work. We'd be grateful. And now I uh, thank you for being here. We'll see you over at the Zoom meeting. We have lots to discuss. I hope you'll be there. There's a link here that should take you there. Make sure you get that link before we close, because once we close, you won't be able to get the link. Thanks, everyone, and God bless you. Go in peace, serve the Lord.